this video I will be introducing the axioms of set theory. Axiom number one is the axiom of extensionality. What this says is that for any set, say the set one, two, three, it doesn't matter about the order or how many times you repeat an object in the set, it just matters the elements of the set. So this set is going to be equal to the set of 2, 1, 1, 3, 2, 3. Okay? Because this has 1, 2, and 3 in it, and this only has 1, 2, and 3 in it. And so these two sets are the same because the order and the amount of times you repeat an object doesn't matter. Okay, and how you say this is that for any set x, that's what this upside down a means, for any x, and for any y, okay, the, uh, it's assumed that these are sets. Any object in axiomatic set theory is a set. x is equal to y if and only if for any set z, z is an element of x, is equivalent to saying z is an element of y. They have the same elements. Okay, x is equal to y, if and only if, they have the exact same elements. It doesn't matter about the order. 1 is an element of this implies 1 is an element of that. 3 is an element of this implies 3 is an element of that. 2 is an element of this. 2 is an element of that. There's nothing in this that's not in that, and everything in this is an element of that. The second one I'm going to say is the axiom of pairing. Okay? And it says that if I'm given a set, say, 1, 2, 3, and another set, say, A, B, C, that there is another set that I can create out of these two that just contains both of them. Okay? And so the exact statement is that for any x and for any y, or for any set x and for any set y, there exists z such that x is an element of z and y is an element of z. That, again, just says that for any two sets, I can put them inside of a set. Axiom number three is the axiom of union. Remember, then in axiomatic set theory, every single object is a set. It doesn't matter whether it's one or two or three. We view them as sets. And I'll show you how to construct the naturals as just a set of sets, but that'll be in a later date. Okay, so what this one says is that if I have a set of sets, say the set of one, two, three, three, four, five, this is a set, then I can union the two sets together so that I get one, two, three, four, five. Okay, I union all the elements in the set together as long as it's a set. Okay, so for any set x, there exists a y such that for any z and for any u, u, an element of z, and z, an element of x, implies that u is an element of y. Okay, so that's the union. Okay, for any element of a set in x, that element is in y. That's exactly the union of all the sets. Okay, and number four, sort of weird, it's called the axiom of uh, regularity. And what it says is that for any set, say 1, 2, 3, I pick one of the elements, which remember is a set, say 1. In this set, I'm going to say might be, say, the, the empty set, okay? In our whatever axiomatized sort of way of defining the natural numbers, let's say 1 is the empty set. And what it says is that for any set... There has to exist one element in which it's disjoint, okay? So 1, the empty set, is disjoint from this set because there are no elements in the empty set, and so there's no elements of this, which is also an element of that. Well, really, what this axiom is saying is that if I have A an element of A, A an element of A is impossible. Can't have it because... By this axiom, if I have the set of A, 
there has to be an element of this which is disjoint from it. Okay, so that means that the only element of this is A. Okay, so that has to be the element disjoint from this, meaning A cannot share any elements with this, meaning that A cannot be an element of A because A has to be disjoint from this set. It prevents infinite descent of just sets, right? We don't allow that. Okay? And that just makes set theory so much better. Okay? It just gets rid of a bunch of paradoxes. It makes it great. And the formal statement here is that for any x, there exists a y such that y is an element of x and, and there does not exist z such that z is an element of x and z is an element of y. Okay, so this just means they're disjoint. This means y is an element of x. So these are what's known as a just normal set theory existence theorems, okay? If there is a set, then this property must hold. Those were what all the axioms before were, but now I'm going to go into construction axioms, axioms that allow you to construct new sets from old sets. Number five, the axiom schema of specification. Okay, and what it says is that if we're given a rule phi of x, say, like, um, x is even, and x is a natural, just so that it makes sense, okay? And then what it says is that given a set, say, n, I can construct a subset of all the set of x, such that x is an element of whatever set, which is n, and phi of x. So for any requirement that I create phi of x, I can create a subset of some set using that requirement. And so the exact statement is that for any x, okay, is that we're going to be given a rule and this is why it's a schema, because this is for each individual rule. Every single individual rule has its own axiom, because I can't write for all phi, because that would mean phi is a set. We have to use just phi outside of it. We have to reference phi from without, outside of everything. For any x, there exists a y such that for any z, Okay, um, is that z is an element of y implies that z is an element of x and phi of z. Number six is going to be the axiom of power set. And the axiom of power set basically means that if I have a set, say one, two, what I can construct from that is its power set. So the set of the empty set the set of 1, the set of 2, and the set of 1, 2. This is the set of all subsets of this set. So the axiom of power set says that for any x there exists y such that for all z, for all, if for all u, u is an element of z implies u is an element of x. This implies that z is an element of y. Okay? This is constructing the power set. This is guaranteeing that z is a subset of x. This is guaranteeing that z is an element of y. y here is the power set. And number seven, number seven is the axiom of replacement. What this basically means is that if I have a function f that brings you from one setting to another, then the image of f, or written f of a, is a set. And so what this means is that we're actually going to have a schema, the axiom, axiom schema of replacement. Given a uh, requirement phi, so this is going to be phi of x, y. For all x, if for all y, y is an element of x, implies that there exists a unique 
Z. There exists the unique Z such that phi of YZ. Okay? So that for any element of the set X, there is a unique value in the outside such that phi of YZ. So this, this is a function. Or phi is going to be a map from X into some range. I'm, I haven't named it yet. Um, and phi of x is equal to y, or in this case, phi of y is going to be equal to z, from right here. This right here is going to be the requirement so that we can move on to the fact that there exists a um, u such that for all y, y is an element of x, implies that there exists a z such that z is an element of u and phi y z. So let's go over this. This is that it's a function, right? This right here is the axial axiom, and what it's saying is that for there exists a set u such that for anything in the domain, there is something in the output such that that maps into it. This is the range. This is just a weird way of writing a function, okay? It's, it might be confusing the way it has to be phrased in order for it to be axiomatic, but trust me on it. We have one more. And this is going to be different from all the rest because it's an existence theorem. It's an existence axiom, sorry, not theorem. And what it says is that eight is that there is an infinite set. There is the natural numbers, okay? So what we'll do here is we'll say that there is an operation S that takes in a set Y, and what it does is I'll put Y union the set of Y. It's weird, but it is called the successor operation, and we'll use this in this axiom. This is just an operation used to signify like plus one. And what it says is that there exists an x such that for any y, y is an element of x, implies the successor of y is an element of x. Why is this important? Well, because the natural numbers, if I replaced x with the natural numbers, and I've replaced y with n, n is an element of the natural numbers, implies that n plus 1 is an element of the natural numbers. The successor operation is like the set theory equivalent of plus 1. And this is just the point of induction. It's the point of everything in math, modern mathematics. It guarantees infinity. So this guarantees infinite sets, and it's called the axiom of infinity. This one is sort of criticized, I guess you could say, even though it shouldn't really be. But a lot of hyperfinitists say that we should get rid of this axiom because the natural numbers shouldn't be a set. I think they're stupid, but that's just an open interpretation because this axiom doesn't necessarily have to be there. It, we could remove it, but math would suck then, right? Everything would go down the drain. So I think I'm just going to include it, and then there's sometimes you include a ninth one, and it's called the axiom of choice. I won't go into it, but just know it exists. And so these are called the ZF axioms. And if you include the axiom of choice, if I include choice, then I get ZFC. And so you might wonder, why on earth did we do all this? Wasn't just normal, unintuitive, unaxiomatic set theory fine? It wasn't. <laughs> if you remember back to the axiom of regularity, right? It was the weirdest one, right? It said that basically, if you looked at it in the glasses that you needed, that A is not an element of A, but get rid of those axioms, and guess what now you can do? You can say that there is a set, I'll call it B, which is going to be the set of all A, such that A is not an element of A. Right? This is just a set 
than I've constructed. Well, guess what? Is B an element of B? Well, you're going to say, well, if B is an element of B, then the requirement is that B is not an element of B. So if B is an element of B, it's not an element of itself. Get out of here. Well, then it's not an element of itself. But the requirement for it not to be an element of itself is for it to be an element of itself. Get that out of here. So it's not an element of itself. It's not not an element of itself. It's nowhere. It's completely bonkers, right? This is called Russell's Paradox. And how do we solve this with the axioms? Well, because you can't construct a set like that. And that's it.